There's a very, very big misconception that farmers voted for Brexit. In reality, that's not true. Only about half of farmers voted for Brexit, while a lot of other farmers did vote to sort of remain in the European Union. Uh, so this idea that they all voted for Brexit isn't necessarily true. And those that did vote for Brexit voted to leave on exactly the same reasons that, well, the fishermen voted for Brexit as well. They were led to believe that the farming subsidy that they received from the EU would be replicated so that they wouldn't really be losing any money. They also believed the noises that the Leave campaign was making, that, you know, this new British, you know, Brexit government, this global Britain would allow them to sell their, 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 their produce all over the world. And this would open up fantastic new markets for them, while also protecting British, you know, agricultural industries and, you know, building them up and, you know, providing them, you know, subsidies or you know, helping them invest in their, their farms for the future. And they bought the line hook, line and sinker. Because that was the noises that the Leave campaign was maining, making. And we always have to remind people, look, always there are the Brexiteers who, they're the ones who deserve your ire and anger. Where you've got people who sort of you know, voted to leave, were conned, tricked and fooled, or in many cases didn't really understand what they were voting for. You know, these were the the con, and you know, to borrow James's James O'Brien's, um, you know, talking point. You know, uh, you know, it's compassion for the con, not the con men. So always, always, always remember. Um, whenever we cover these stories, um, even if this, you know, as we'll go over today, this guy in this this pig farmer that we're going over in sort of his state, um, he has had to lose his entire business, his entire sort of livelihood and, and sort of, you know, his business and sort of what he's been doing for, well, most of his life. So, you know, this guy does deserve, you know, a form of sympathy. And it doesn't matter that he, whether he voted for Brexit or not, this is a consequence of what the Brexiteers um, said would never happen. And of course, continues to happen despite their fantasy and beliefs of what was really going to happen with Brexit. So before we go uh, diving uh, into this piece, uh, please do remember to hit that like, share and subscribe button, <laughs> subscribe button. And also down below, there are links to my Patreon page and a one of today's link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can buy me a coffee. Or there is the YouTube thank you button down below as well. There is also the uh, uh, YouTube subscription, The Pony Club. And of course, remember, we are doing a weekly video now for all Patreon members and uh, the Pony Club members as well. So, uh, on we go today then to today's uh, story. So, but before we do that, do remember to, and thank you very much to all those people who do support the channel as well. So, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, where, where are we? Yes, yes, over to here. Yes, to the East Anglia uh, Daily Times with their title of West Suffolk Pig Farmer reluctantly decides to sell herd after a very torrid year. So, oh, sorry, after a torrid year. Although I feel that after a very torrid year, might be a better title for your article, but there you go. If you wanted to you know, chunk out a word, fair enough. Anyway, so a prominent Suffolk uh, farmer is quitting the pig industry after a dire 12 months for the sector. A fourth generation pig farmer, George Gittis of, uh, Salmon, uh, of Salmon's Farm near Bury St. Edmunds, has decided that enough was enough in February. The pig industry has been racked by crises, leading to an exodus of the smaller players and a consolidation of businesses. Prices plummeted over the last year while costs soared. Chronic shortages of labour brought on by Brexit and the pandemic resulted in huge backlogs and delays at abattoirs. Pigs were stuck on farms, eating through farmers' profits. They became overweight and therefore less commercially viable. And the industry was brought to its knees. The Russian invasion, uh, Russian invasion, uh, uh, invasion uh, of of of, U of Ukraine war on February of twenty fourth exasperated these problems, and the industry uh, has as as now as there's a feed prices have, have rocketed. Yeah, that, that's a bit weird way to, to phrase that sentence. The Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine war on. <laughs> yeah. 
that certainly needs that certainly needs uh, some editorial stuff east anglia uh, daily times but never mind um yeah anyway we continue um it was a tough decision for george as pigs have played a major part in the guinness family business going back for more than 100 years his great great grandfather uh, and father all kept them and son freddie who works on the farm was the fifth generation to be involved they adopted an outdoor regime and bred pedigree pigs, with some pigs spending all their adult lives um, outdoors. There was no better system, he said. But it has become a loss maker, a making it increasingly unviable. I'm afraid we've had to decide to call it a day. We've lost money, like most other pig producers in the last 12 months, but we sadly don't see a future for independents like us. The industry has... Uh, either has to restructure itself or it is so broken to the extent it doesn't see a future for what we are doing now or how we do it. George, who also runs a successful um, arable operation and a business park with a, a, with a biogas plant at his farm off the A4 at Straxham, said that in the early 1990s there had been over 2,000 sows, but that was cut to 550 in the early 2000s. This year, he made the very difficult decision to sell his herd. The last weaning of sows, along with some of their pigs, that they were finishing all, are all that is left. The three-strong team, which uh, has run the unit until now, all at the site of Brandon, are being now laid off. We have made this difficult decision in February that we were going to close the herd, he said. Our financial year is the end of February, and we were looking at what we had lost and what we have forecast to grow go forward in the next 12 months. They could have, uh, it could have been uh, toughed out, he said, but they would felt they'd reached the end of the road. And we are not alone, unfortunately. And this is the key point. We are not alone, unfortunately. And this is going to come really badly to bite back in the Conservatives because they are destroying a lot of British farming and they are seriously turning against the Conservatives. Most of these big successes that we have seen in the recent by-elections down, down in sort of the blue wall have been because farmers have turned against the Conservatives. So... That will ultimately continue uh, as we see stuff going forward. Anyway, he continues. Uh, he said, we have been uh, keeping pigs for over 100 years, and we are pedigree Essex pig, breed, pig, pig breeders and large white breeders. So it was a tough decision to make from our point of view. When the final sow leaves, George will retain about eight piglets on the farm for a hobby on the basis so that his and his family can still enjoy homegrown pork. The last major contraction for the business it was suffered back in 2004 when 20 of his workers were laid off following a very fraught period for the industry in the early 2000s the classical swine fever uh, was followed by foot and mouth outbreaks which will then close down the countryside and the crisis followed and by the way this is something else that we don't often hear because we had both those crises of the foot and mouth outbreak and the um you know the swine fever you know in the early 2000s the British farming industry is still very much recovering from those, just as a lot of the sort of the beef industry and sort of the, the cow industry, the dairy and milk industry is still suffering from the, the mad cow disease back in like the the uh, the nineties when that broke out. So, you know, some of these, you know, these types of things can have a long term consequences on on farmers like this. So anyway, it continued. Uh, there was also the financial fallout. Uh, and had to sell over a thousand acres and that was an enormous stress george suffered a nervous breakdown he recovered but he did keep his farm and business on track seeing the last two sow to go has been a sad moment but he's been supported by his wife jane and children uh, he said it's tough and i've agonized and i've put my management team and my wife and family through hell because i thought like tooth and nail to see if it could work he said it was probably equally as stressful compared to back to 2004 when I was having my own mental breakdown. I've learned how to manage it. Those in the industry care passionately, he said. And tragically, during the last major pig crisis of the early 2000s, there were even some suicides, he added. But not today and this time around. He's developed his own coping mechanisms to help him with to deal with the stress, he, uh, having learned from his experiences in 2004, he said. So as you can see, this puts a lot of pressure on, on people like this. So, you know, um, and like I said, this is this is guys, you know, business and stuff like that. And, you know, they care about this, you know. 
people who are in farming don't just go into farming to make money. They they do it because they they love what they do and because they have a passion for it. Um, so obviously, when you know bad stuff happens, it can affect them really, really negatively. Uh, but, 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 where we go? Uh, so the problem. Uh, said George, is that while consumers say they want high, envir high environmental and welfare standards, they don't want to pay for it. Cheap imports of pig meat produced to lower quality standards are increasingly undercutting the domestic market. Since he's been involved in the industry, he has seen the UK's self-sufficiency self in pork product plummet, which saddens him greatly. While UK farmers were, quote, rightly held uh, to a high standards, this was not the same expectation from imported produce, he argued which is what we are seeing from a lot of our, you know, trade deals that Liz Truss is signing. UK farmers forced to, you know, well, not forced, but having to follow these, you know, high standards while, you know, you've got the the massive farms in, 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 uh, in I was going to say America, in, uh, in Australia, which are huge if you look up the size of them. And the amount of, you know, the, and they do not follow the, the rigorously high standards that we have to follow. And as a result, they can just flood the market with cheap pork products, which inevitably hurts domestic producers. And again, the Tories don't care because this was always the goal at the end of the day. Um, so everybody has been expecting everything to keep going down in price, he said. We are exporting everything, including our own conscious. The other notable Suffolk off races have also had to downsize recently. Uh, Blacks of Bacton took over the very difficult decision to sell its sows and pare the business down and to finish pig farming, not because, uh, because, sorry, because the financial side was no longer stacking up. Peter Mortimer of Mayfield in North Suffolk also decided to quit the industry, but now has been running a bed and breakfast service for another pig operation. <laughs> Uh, Peddler's Pig in North Suffolk. He's also uh, edging upwards. The price of uh, farmers to get their pigs is still below the £2 per kilogram. That has also been far lower in recent times. And the cost of producing a pig in the UK is estimated to be about £2.44 uh, £2 per, per, per kilogram, where the average price being paid in August was about 197 pence. Um, I don't know if that's one pound ninety seven pence or is uh, yeah that, that doesn't make sense one hundred and ninety seven pennies um, <laughs> okay um, and it's still rendered it, it completely loss making uh, the National Union of Farmers and the Regional East Director Zoe Leach was formerly the chief executive of the National Pig Association before moving to a new role in August this year said that during the current crisis we estimate that we've lost over sixty k sows already and more will go this equates to about 15% of the national sow herd, she said. So that's a lot. That's a lot to lose. Uh, before the crisis, the UK was able to produce about 50 to 60% of its pork, but because of the carcass balance issues and the result of the trade, uh, result of trade, it exports around about 15 to 12% of what it produces. And as a result, just 40% of the pork eaten in British uh, is British produced, is British produced here. And the result, uh, the zest is largely imported, largely from the European Union, he said. Lord knows what the impact of losing all those sows will be have on that figure, though. But just because it takes nine to ten months for a pig to reach market weight, the gap in pigs is only just starting to come through now, so it won't really be properly felt until September. So, yeah, this is, you know, this is sort of, you know, a massive blow. Uh, to the UK farming sector, that this was always going to happen, and we always said it was going to happen, for the pure fact that as much as the Brexiteers banged on about wanting to support, you know, the fishing industry, the farming industry, you know, bring back manufacturing uh, to the UK, um, you know, all this stuff that they apparently cared about, now that they actually have the chance to help these people, to help these industries, they haven't really been following through. Instead, they've been doing far the opposite of that. Um, and it's, you know, what we warned people about. But there you go. Um, so hopefully there will be a realisation eventually that, you know, these people, you know, that, you know, we were conned and that, you know, this, you know, hasn't gone rightly, which I think we are headed in 
that direction slowly but surely we are headed in that direction you know the, all the polls are saying we are headed in the direction it is going the exactly the same way as the iraq war went of massive polls saying that there was a massive support for it and over time as you know everything happened less and less support and then even you look at the sort of the mid beginning polls you should be able to go out into the street and find someone who's in favor of the iraq war but now you know <laughs> You would not be able to, to find someone. And it will be the same for Brexit. It does look like it is heading in the exact same direction. And the Conservatives have a lot to answer for. And I really do think Labour needs to be start going, this isn't a just Brexit. This is Conservative Brexit. Because the offer that was put forward by, first of all, the Leave campaign, and then Theresa May, uh, was a very, very soft Brexit, ultimately, at the end of the day. I mean, they only won by 2%. You can't really justify this harsh, hardest of all possible Brexit that end that we ended up getting was what people voted for in 2016 because it was nothing like what the Leave campaign offered. So, yeah, like I say, time is coming and there will be a reckoning. Um, trust me on that. There is there is a reckoning coming, and they cannot avoid forever ignoring all the problems that Brexit has caused. Like I say, the pandemic has been massively favourable to them because they've been able to blame all the Brexit problems on, on the pandemic. But the further and further we get from that, the less they will be able to blame that. And more and more, the very evident damage of Brexit will come to the fore. So, as always, uh, thank you very much uh, for watching. Uh, please do remember to hit the uh, like, share, and subscribe button. And, of course, down below there are links to my Patreon page and our donation link called Buy Me Coffee, where you can well buy me coffee. And, as always, thank you very much uh, for watching, and we'll see you all next time.